Poems to a Listener, Readings and Conversation with Contemporary Poets. The Problem of the Dark. Lacking electric light or other artifice, the instruction of night is hit or miss. Strolling's a dream state, nightmare to run. Feels she negotiates drop to canyon. She makes her foot wait, feel for what's next. She's far in. The edge of the work of her war is air on skin. Welcome to Poems to a Listener. I'm Henry Lyman, and in this half-hour program, we'll be visiting with poet Marie Ponset and listening to poems from her books Admit Impediment and The Green Dark, both published by Knopf. The poem we just heard pictures someone carefully feeling her way through the darkness. I have a place in the country where there is no electricity and sometimes the batteries on the flashlight are out. And sometimes I just stumble around in the dark for the sheer experience of it. Finding your way. Finding your way. The edge of your work is air on skin, the poem says. How do you mean that? I think that um, that edge, that sense of the outside, uh, the skin as a boundary between the outside and the inside, is a sort of a contour map for those two worlds. And... I think that you can see the outside world in a different way if you're not looking at it. By just feeling. By feeling your way through it. Yeah. And the way she feels, the way you feel your way through it here in the poem, is very careful. If you literally go out into a space, even one you know quite well, in the dark, you find that you bloody well better be careful because <laughs> otherwise you'll fall on your face. Call. Child, like a candelabra at the head of my bed, wake in me and watch me as I sleep. Maintain your child life undistracted, where, at the borders of its light, it has such dulcet limits, it becomes the dark. Maintain against my hungry selfishness, your simple gaze where fear has left no mark. Today, my dead mother, to my distress, said on the dream phone, Marie, I'll come read to you, hung up, and in her usual dress came and stood here. cold, though I know I need her true message, I faced her with tenderness and said, this isn't right, and she agreed. Child, watched by your deeper sleep, I may yet say yes. You might yet say yes. I suppose that even when you get to be my age, you still hope that you'll grow up. <laughs> <laughs> and have you? Not yet. And I do still have that ambition to be a real grown-up and to accept all of my past equally and let it all in. To what? To that childhood self? Yes. It's back there behind some kind of screen. And sometimes in sleep, you notice that the real guardian of your inner life is this child figure child, that, yeah. that was wide open to learning everything. Yeah. Yeah. For example, the, the child is seen as light, and the edges of that light are soft and commingle with the darkness in some way. Yes, that's it. There's a readiness in the child, as I was a child, to trust both the dark and the light. Trust and 
the power to make conscious choice and to eliminate some things and select others makes trust less attractive. You don't trust, you choose. You think you know what you're doing. And probably you do. I, I wouldn't devalue that either. But I wish I could grow up to the point where I could both choose where that's appropriate and open the door to that other kind of trust in the universe, hmm. both light and dark. Maybe I will someday. Hard Shell Clams. When it was too late for him to provide his own share in my happy childhood, my father stopped clowning out stories and tried for a whole day to see me. A good try by both of us. Back we went to the seaside of old summers. We too, we talked, we swam, sleek with cocoa butter that caught the sand, a glitter like chain mail guarding who I am from his used blue gaze that stared to understand. Closed, stuck closed, I watched us, far me, far him, go small, smaller, further, father, joy dim in beech light, our last chance, last perfect day. We laughed. We ate four dozen hard shell clams. We swallowed what I would not let us say. Four dozen. <laughs> That's a lot of clams. Yes, well, you know, if you've been swimming and racing around the beach and so forth, you can get very hungry. And mm. if you're not eating much else, you can do in a lot of clams. <laughs> and besides, it prevented us from talking. That's what I was going to say. You, uh, <laughs> instead of talking, you ate. Yes. What were you trying to do there on that beach that day? The odd thing is that I have no evidence other than my own intuition to tell me what my father wanted. But I feel more certain of what he wanted than of what I did. I think he really wanted to make connection mm -hmm. in some very simple way that we had long lost. I think he would have liked to restore that connection that we must have had at some point. To see through what, what had come between. Yes. And I wanted it too, but at that point in my life I couldn't somehow um, relax my wish to be independent and yeah. separate. And maintain a, a particular image of yourself, a particular concept of yourself. Exactly. Well, it's like a hard shell. Yes. In a way. Hard, an invisible. Chain mail. Chain mail. In reality, composed of nothing more than tiny little bits of sand, mm -hmm. but as effective as if it were really chain mail. Mm could have been brushed away, washed away, easily, but only if one were willing. We have a tendency to do this all the time, though, to step into poses. Yes. Shells. They're not easy to shuck sometimes, or at least we don't see how to get rid of them. Maybe like the clam, we need them sometimes. Hmm. Between, for my daughter, Composed in a shine of laughing, Monique brings in sacks of groceries, unloads them, straightens, and stretches her back. The child was a girl, the girl is a woman, the shift is subtle and absolute, worn like a gift. The woman, once girl, once child, now is deft in her ease, is door to the forum, is cutter of keys. In space that her torque and lift have prefigured and set free, between her mother and her child, the woman stands, having emptied her hands.
This was an actual moment. Yes. An instant. She came in, and that's how she looked. She looked wonderful. <laughs> and she was between my granddaughter and myself in the room. She moves with such ease here. It's just uh, it's gesture, putting down the groceries, the laugh, the hands emptying themselves. I think everyone has that experience of suddenly really seeing someone you're used to seeing, a face or a series of gestures that you've seen a hundred times but never really noticed. I could really see her. I, I can run the film of mm. that moment through my head right now. <laughs> her motion seems to set the space between you free, to liberate that space somehow. Yes, I think if you ever get to the point where you can see your children as they really are, <laughs> the space becomes more free. Especially if they've taken the trouble, as my daughter indeed had, to grow up. Ah. That moment of seeing my daughter was a moment of enormous pleasure for me because I could see that these two very beautiful females in the room with me were quite separate and very alive. Wearing the gaze of an archaic statue, the juggler in her suit of nerve is eyes and hands. The rest of her dangles soft shoe below her shoulders, relaxed, cooperating. She knows that to toss things out is something, but not much, not important, is for the sake of when picturing a ribboning like water spurting she is holding nothing. She is on her own here. She is not just letting go. And her small, touching skill is holding nothing. Holding on, she is not a juggler. She is you and me, hands full of things she must practice juggling to get out from under. She sets her feet and begins. She smiles like Pomona, offering three, a dozen, lifeless, bits and pieces she can't get rid of. She presents them as shapeliness and they lose weight. The rhythm clarifies something, maybe her. She settles back a laughing fountain pumping particles. The order of motion emerges. Up they loft, one by one. She is tossing up spheres, sticks, boxes, soft, metallic. Out with them she goes till her hands close on nothing, are just touched for the electric seconds of netting the elements with energy in air. They drop, sprout, up, out, drop, up, and slowly each touch makes her invisible, save as a phase of the great legislation she proposes to obey. That's balance. I was able to write this poem and have it turn into something as I was writing it, simply because I had learned to juggle. And of course, it turned into a metaphor. How does it um, translate itself into our lives? Well, one of the remedies for greed, which I think is our simplest uh, crime against our own nature, is to let things go. Otherwise, they might hold on to us. Indeed. The art of the juggler, as the poem points out, is to hold nothing, merely touching the objects very briefly for a mere instant to keep them in the air. I think that is what the poem is about. It's about that great hope that we all have to arrive at some measure of freedom. Getting out from under. Getting out from <laughs> under, yes. 
And to be free is to be active. It's active but invisible, in a way. I mean, the uh, the juggler becomes invisible behind her actions. Yes, in behalf of some larger view of, of life that she's mm. trying to take part in. That greater legislation? Yes. I guess what I'm talking about is some some view of what humanity could be if we really were social animals. But we're often legislated by uh, other forces. That's why it says at the end she proposes to obey. Maybe she hasn't got it quite clear yet. I don't think she has. But she proposes to herself that she will obey a great legislation. Live model. Who wouldn't rather paint than pose? Modeling? You're an itch the artist doesn't want to scratch, at least not directly, and not yet. You think, at last, a man who knows how bodies are metaphors. You're wrong. First time I posed for him, he made a gilded throne to sit me on, crowned, open-armed, in a blue half-gown, I sat his way, which was not one of mine, but stiff and breakable as glass, pale still, as if with a rose tree up my spine. We had to be speechless, too, gut tight in a saccharine, thermal hush of love and art. Even songs and poems were too mundane for me to quote to ease our grand feelings. So I sat mute, as if with a rose tree down my throat. Now I breathe deep, I sit slack. I've thrown the glass out, spit, evacuated bushels of roses. I've got my old quick walk and my big dirty voice back. Why do I still, sometimes, sit on what is unmistakably like a throne? Why not? Bodies are metaphors, and this one's my own. He poses you, you pose for him, stiffly, breakable as if you were full of glass, as if with a rose tree up your spine. <laughs> What's happening here? An image is being imposed on you, then? Yes, I think perhaps one of the first things that happens uh, if one is flattered is that one tries to become something one isn't, because you know you really aren't mm. that... Ladylike. Ladylike, <laughs> super sanct. Porcelain. Yes. Figurine. So if you're set up that way, you try to become it. And you like it very much because you're successful at becoming it, and then you realize you hate it. <laughs> but women have a long history of posing for artists. <laughs> and men. Yes, and men. How do the men, how do we pose? How are we uh, asked to pose? Oh, to be strong. <laughs> uh, to be free of anxiety. That'll be the day. <laughs> <laughs> Women can be nervous, but men have to know what they're doing. Oh, yes, right. Calm. <laughs> Outwardly. Terrible. In the poem, you throw all this away, all pose. Oh, it's so just, lovely. It's kind of sprawl at the end. Yes. Kick out your legs. That's right. <laughs> Spit out the glass that uh, you're stuffed with. That's right. Evacuate bushels of roses. Mm-hmm. And you get your real dirty boys back. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Become your old self again. <laughs> but you still like to sit on a throne sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. The poem suggests. Sometimes. I have a certain measure of pompous ass built right into the structure. <laughs> 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 and I like to make, make believe I'm grand every once in a while. But when you choose to do so. Yes. For a season. 
we saw we had few words to exchange when two by two by two over our heads birds like omens flew making space between us dangerous glances can be truthful this i learned when with your sharp breath the time turned very sharp and felicitous and truth is unknowable who knows how far to where the loving goes when its action makes free of us generously we lay together under the irish weather it was summer due to us No one's imposing anything on anybody here. I think love is possible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do. And it comes to the two of you here, making the space between you dangerous. Yes, full of, of possibility, good and bad and strange and not strange and so dangerous. In a way, for the moment, it takes mm. you out of yourself. So it takes its liberties. Love makes free of us, the poem says. It visits us, it seems yeah. to do, and takes liberty, yes. Does it liberate us, too? Certainly we think it does. <laughs> outward. Through us and outward. Oh. But it's as if love is some big principle of the universe, mm. somehow or other. Um, so you can, without being too crazy, imagine that love makes free of us. And extends and, us. Yes. To what? To see. Hardships of the ordinary astronomer. On summer nights, when, after much sun, the temperate flesh is ready to lie out in the meadow and study, all the wide, high airs awash and flickering. Stars crowd in thickets. They brush in, brush out of sight, swamping the map in mind. This winter night, when feet and face long to navigate closely the radial ambience of stove, the heavy cold declaims the stars' courses. They stand out in the glass and propose their formations, which advance, engraved, each distance visible for those with shelter and strong instruments. Short of sun, we can't face the cold long enough to learn if other suns can warm. Our sun we glory in. It clothes and clocks us, obedient to what we can afford to admit of light. It hides us from the galaxies, and them, for a while, from our sight. Its dark hides us daily, though apparent dark has passed. Even if aloft, where we drift immersed in sunwash, we do not imagine under how much human night our day is cast. This part of the poem speaks of summer nights, when we look at the skies and marvel at them, the winter nights, when we hide from their cold, and then also this other night, human night. How do you mean that? I'm not sure how I mean it, but I sometimes think that the human race is at a very early stage of its possible development. We've only been around a few million years. Maybe we need plenty of million more before the light of true understanding mm. or whatever glorious thing we seem at moments capable of is something we could live with all day, every mm. day. Maybe the fact that the sun 
prevents us from seeing the cosmos is just as well. Maybe the light of the sun is all we can bear. Maybe if the light of the whole cosmic structure flooded in on mm. us at once, we'd drown. <laughs> I mean, we need to be protected in our ignorance. In we need so, to be protected in our ignorance. And of that also, the, the human night is, is composed. So that beyond all the things of ill will and failure and betrayal that compose human night, there are these other elements in mm. it. Night is beneficent as well. Mm. Warming. Yes. Embracing. Yes. It awakens things other than sight. We are awakened to ourselves, perhaps, better at night than during the busy day. We can see the universe and we can see ourselves at the same time. And yes, we have that chance. Drawn, though confused by our longing, to acclimatize our vision, to what we think are night skies. We choose coordinates, set up the tripod, save up for the lens. We study charts with a pleasure made modest by knowing whatever our algebra aims at, it is ourselves we measure. Yet it is the personal that links us body to body in the gigantic intercourse, fugal among the spheres. We are, in person, those who, though our sun's dark interferes, are drawn and stare and listen to catch tremendous vestiges. Our hands where the capacity inheres, record what we have caught. Our eyes, able to, read what other hands report. Though we suppose that personal time comes close as sleep to silence, while the faithful heart knocks softly in its cage, and suppose Kept time is louder, though it only ticks or hums according to our pleasure. We know we are children in what we suppose, having no ear or other acoustical devices, nor any lens or vehicle that can come anywhere near there where principal brilliance blinking the galaxies incorporates unmediated our mortal loud flutes bass fiddles drums We've been visiting with poet Marie Ponset and listening to poems from Admit Impediment and from The Green Dark, both published by Knopf. I'm Henry Lyman. Thanks for being with us. Poems to a Listener was produced by Henry Lyman in cooperation with WFCR Amherst, Massachusetts. Financial assistance was provided by the Massachusetts Council on the Arts and Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Massachusetts Foundation for Humanities and Public Policy.